Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right. It's a blessing to be here this morning Amen. with each, each and every one of you. Um, got a lot of things been going on in our life lately. As many of you know, uh, my wife is, she's full term now, and so we're expecting a a baby any time, and if uh, life can't get more uh, chaotic than that, uh, we are also, what's that? Well, she could be pregnant with ten, twins, that would be probably even more of a hurdle. Um, yeah, on, on top of that, we've listed our house for sale, you know, we've, we've been working very hard with that, and uh, just praying for the Lord's direction in, in, that, uh, in that regard. Uh, just a little bit of announcement. We got uh, the, the listing went live yesterday, and we already received an offer last night. So full price offer. <laughs> so, yeah, we, uh, we haven't signed it yet, so it's not official. You still need to pray about it before you accept it. Yeah, right, of course. And uh, so that's been happening, and uh, you know, had to preach today. And uh, over the last several uh, messages, I've been talking about Babylon, yeah. right? We've been talking about Babylon and going through a series on Babylon, which I was planning to do that today. Uh, I woke up this morning, and uh, I just had some, you know, kind of final touches and things to do for the presentation. Uh, I want to do a PowerPoint, you know, I've been doing it on PowerPoint and um, for those messages. And so I woke up this morning and to finish the message and finish up the PowerPoint, but there was no power. So instead of a PowerPoint today, you're just getting a point. <laughs> without, the, without the power. Well, we need the power, right? We're expecting God to give us the power, not the... But so anyways, <laughs> when I found out there was no power, I thought, well, okay, well, I guess, Lord, you want me to do another message. And it's in interesting how that works sometimes. And you come to Sabbath school, and they're talking about the same thing that you're going to preach about, and a lot of the same verses. And you realize, yeah, you realize that uh, somebody else is in control. And so I hope that uh, you'll be blessed by the message. So let us get started with a word of prayer. Amen. Father in heaven, Father, we come before you in the name of your dear son, Jesus. And thank you that we can gather here together on the Sabbath day. And I pray for each one of my brothers and sisters here. Father, that, uh, Lord, I know that we live in a wicked, evil, fallen world. And we are not immune to the effects of that. And I know some of my dear brothers here are, and sisters are, are struggling, are hurting. They have pain in their heart. And Father, just pray for a special measure of your comfort this morning. Yeah. And Father, for each one of us that are trying to strive against the evil and wickedness, that you will give us a special measure of your grace and your power, and that you will work in each one of our hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, when I was a teenager, as if uh, being a teenager isn't awkward enough, when I was a teenager, one time, I got a wart on my nose. Anybody ever have a wart? Yeah. You ever had a wart? Yeah. Well, I got one on my nose. And it was very embarrassing. And it wasn't like on the tip of my nose. It was actually in the part of my nose right there. I don't know what they call it. Is the septum or something like that? Right there on the nose. It's, that is probably the most sensitive part <laughs> on the body. <laughs> but I got a wart. So I tried to clip it off with nail clippers. And that thing bled profusely. And it, it cut it back, and then it scabbed over, and then it came back. 
So I went to the doctor and they froze it off. And it went away, it healed, it went away. And then guess what happened next? It came back. They froze it off, burnt it off, tried to cut it off. But this thing, it just kept coming back. And it was frustrating as a teenager, you know, you got to deal with pimples. It's like, ah, I got to deal with the wart on my nose. No matter what I did, it grew back because all those attempts, it didn't actually remove it at all. You see, it was only removing what was on the surface. Now they say, and you probably heard it said before that, you know, that, that warts, they, get, they got roots, right? Well, they say that's not actually true. They don't have roots, but somehow I was cutting this thing off, but it didn't get deep enough. There was still something in there, deep, deep up in there, that was still surviving. And so eventually it was painful, but I finally got some nail clippers and I, I just cut a huge chunk of my, of my nose off right here. I cut it so deep and it was, of course, it was extremely painful and it bled profusely, but finally I got it, it went away. So I don't have a ward anymore, amen? <laughs> What's that? Even if I did have a ward today, I could probably deal with it and handle it like emotionally better than when you're a teenager, right? <laughs> so it was buried deep down in there. And to remove it, I had to go deeper. I had to get it and root it out at the core and not just snip away at the surface. My message this morning is entitled, Inside Out. Inside Out. Now, another question for you guys. With a show of hands, how many of, your, how many of you guys, how many of you would consider yourselves to be perfect? Nobody? Nice Come on now. Somebody's got to be perfect in here, right? Isn't this the church of God? Aren't we the sons of God? You tell me nobody's perfect? Don't be shy. Nobody wants to raise their hand. I don't judge, so I can't say that. <laughs> Whoa. I hope there's somebody in here perfect Christ. Yeah. It's kind of a catch-22. Right? That was kind of a trick question because if you raise your hand, either you're blind to your true condition, self deceived, or you're self deceived, or you're proud. So nobody's nobody's eager to raise their hand and say I'm perfect. But that causes a little bit of a dilemma. Turn with me to Matthew chapter five. A little bit of a dilemma because everybody in here, nobody raised their hand. Nobody said. I'm perfect. Yet Christ in Matthew chapter 5, let's read in verse 48. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48, he says, Be ye therefore what? Perfect. So Christ gave us a command. He told us, be perfect. Yet none of us raised our hand. We're striving to be perfect. Striving to be perfect. Amen. Now, it doesn't say just be perfect, right? He says, be ye therefore perfect, how? Even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. Now, that's a serious command. That's a very high calling, is it not? Yes. To be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect? That is quite an undertaking, right? Right? It seems impossible. And for us, yeah, it is. With men, all, th you know, with men, it's impossible. With God, all things are possible, right? So Jesus said to be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that look like? I'm sure if you asked a dozen people, what does it mean to be perfect? You'd probably get a dozen different answers. 
of what that means. And more importantly, if we are to be perfect, how can we attain to that? How can we get there? Because Christ commanded it. How do we get to that point where we are perfect? Is it possible? Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know, we don't like to talk about perfection, and I don't like to talk about it either, because when we look at ourselves, we see how imperfect we are. Isn't that right? And so it makes us uncomfortable. It makes us really uncomfortable, because we see we're supposed to be perfect, and yet we're not. But 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, starting in verse 16, says, All what? All Scripture. Now that includes what, brothers and sisters? Last week we heard a message on it, the King James Bible, right? And not just the New Testament, all Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is what? Profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. And verse 17, here's the key verse. It says, that the man of God may be what? Perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, these series of verses, they reveal a couple of things. The first one is that the man of God may be what? May be. He may be. So does that exclude the possibility of perfection? Or does that include that it's possible? If it says he may be perfect then it is possible for him to be perfect. Now, that's not my words. That's what the Word of God says, right? So it says that man may be. And if a man isn't, he can be. It is possible. The second thing is that perfection accomplished in the man happens and occurs through what? How does it happen? How does it happen there? By faith. By faith, right. But in the text right here, it says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. So the Scripture is given for what reason? That the man of God may be perfect. Now, do you think it's any coincidence today that they're all... There's all manner of Bibles. Now, you can choose which one your Bible you like, right? And, you know, it's whichever one suits you. So there's all manner of Bible. Not only that, is that even amongst those that will say, hey, let's look at the King James Version, there's still many different interpretations. And there's many private interpretations. And there's many different beliefs. There's a lot of confusion today in our world about what the Word of God actually says. Isn't that right? Yeah. Now, why would that be the case? Because it says right here that the Scriptures are given for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instructions, so that you may be perfect. So, Scripture is profitable to that end. Now, profit. So let's talk about profit. Not as in like... A prophet of God, but the word prophet says it's profitable. Now, profit is something that you've gained. Isn't that right? For example, if you make an investment, you expect a return on that investment. You, you expect a profit, right? You put something in and you expect something in return. Now, Scripture is profitable. It's profitable, but you have to invest in it. Isn't that right? Yes. We have to invest in it. It's not going to be profitable if we don't invest ourselves, if we don't invest time, if we don't invest ourselves in testing the Word or applying the Word to our life. So we have to invest our time and energy studying and meditating on the Word. Otherwise, it doesn't profit anything. If it just sits on a, on a shelf. So scripture is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, 
in, what does it say? In righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly what? Furnished. So when it talks about the word of God being profitable uh, in righteousness, you know, that's not a righteousness that is something that is written down. It's not what I, I call righteousness on paper or paper righteousness. It's something that is just a, a legal declaration or something that's written down in the books of heaven, but it has no bearing on your life. You know, there's a lot of religions, a lot of churches that basically teach that. This is uh, something that they have inculcated in their lives. And that is that, hey, you accept Christ and, you know, he's your righteousness. He's your perfection. And that's true, right? That's true. He is our righteousness. He is our perfection. But it essentially stops there. That there's a disconnect between like practical life and reality. There's a disconnect between what God does in heaven and what he does here. That when many people talk about righteousness, they talk about what Christ does. It's simply what he has done in the past or what he's doing up in heaven. But many times it doesn't have any practical bearing in our life in our homes, in our families. You know, obviously this is something that, that Glenn has been emphasizing over and over again about our children, our families, the broken homes that we see. I mean, how many Christians today have grown up or come from a broken home? In fact, it's probably rarer today to grow up in a home that has not, the parents have not been divorced. In fact, I don't want to show a raise of hands, but I, I, it's affected all of us. And it's a, it's a symptom that is permeating all of society. In Christianity, you look at what is taking place in the homes of Christians today. It's not really any different than what is taking place in the home of the heathen. Isn't that right? That's right? A lot of the things that are taking place. And the result of that is the broken homes and the broken families, the broken lives. It's because we've separated the theory of the gospel and the theory of Christ, what Christ has done from the practical reality in our lives. Now... Going back to 2 Timothy chapter 3. You see, righteousness is not just a state or a condition. I, I believe it includes that. It's a condition of acceptance from God. Yeah, I believe it includes that, but it's more. It should be a practical reality in the life and how we think and act towards ourselves and towards others. Going back to 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, Scripture is given by inspiration. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction, and righteousness. Scripture gives us the instructions that guide us in the way of righteousness, that we may be perfect. So it gives us the instruction of righteousness that the man may be perfect. So there is a correlation between being righteous and being perfect. Is that fair to say? All right. Being righteous and being perfect. So it stands to reason that if we're righteous, we should also be perfect. Correct or incorrect? Correct. Makes sense to me. Now, moving on, I want to look at a couple in the, there's an interesting statement that I want to just look at real quick. It's uh, in Luke chapter one. It's about a couple that gave birth to a very prominent individual. Luke chapter one, and we'll start in verse five. Luke chapter 1, verse 5, it says, There was a, in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And who did they give birth to? John the Baptist. Now look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, They were both what? 
They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. I find that to be an interesting text. It's very, very interesting. Now, was Zacharias and Elizabeth, were they righteous because they walked in all the commandments and ordinances? But if you read this text, if you just take it on the surface, if you just read it for what it says, it seems to indicate, and I wouldn't blame anybody, I would say it's, it's probably incomplete because we need to compare Scripture with Scripture, right? So if you read it on the surface, you would, could come to the conclusion that they were righteous because they walked in the commandments and the ordinances. So there is certainly... There is an element to that, that to be righteous, we must walk in the commandments and ordinances. But I would say, and we'll look at this a little bit further, that walking in the commandments and ordinances is an evidence of righteousness Amen. in the person, that the person has been made righteous. Great. Because we have plenty of examples, especially in the New Testament, of those who thought they were walking in the commandments and ordinances, and yet they were very much unrighteous. So, now I find that interesting that it says here that they were both righteous before God, walking in the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. Now, if you go four chapters ahead in Luke chapter 5, verse 32... Luke 5.32, it says, Jesus speaking, he says, I'm not come to call the righteous. Well, that's interesting. I'm not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Well, I find that to be very interesting because it says on one hand, Zacharias and Elizabeth, they were righteous. But then Jesus later on says, I haven't come to call the righteous. I've come to call sinners. Now, 13 chapters after that, let's skip over to Luke chapter 18. Jesus gives a parable about two worshipers. He gives a parable about two worshipers. You're probably familiar with it. We're not going to read all of it. But the worshipers are the Pharisee and the publican. The Pharisee and the publican. And now he's given a parable about these two people that come to worship. And he's illustrating the difference in attitude and spirit between the two of them. Now, verse 9. Uh, it says, And he spake this parable unto certain which did what? Trusted in themselves that they were. So... They trusted in who? In God? They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. And that caused them to despise others. Well, that's very, very fascinating. If we find ourselves despising others, does that mean... Could that be a symptom that we trust in ourselves or we trust to our own righteousness? So if we find somebody that's continually, perhaps overly critical, constantly putting others down or, or correcting others or despising others, would that be a symptom of self-righteousness? Just a thought. Because he says here, that he's speaking this parable about those that trusted in themselves. And what did they do? They despised others. Now look at verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a publican, which is a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. <laughs> uh, you ever prayed like that? I hope not. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, that I'm not like this other person. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. 
I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. Amen. Hmm. So God illustrates, Christ illustrates right here, the attitude of those that are considered righteous or justified. Because he says in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. He had a divine revelation. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be brought low, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So, of course, when I ask you the question, how many people in here are perfect? I'm glad nobody raised their hand. <laughs> Because the attitude we see here is that the, per, the person that has been justified realizes that in and of themselves, they have no righteousness. They have no ability Amen. to make themselves righteous or to do righteousness Amen. or to cleanse themselves or to change themselves. But not the Pharisee. The Pharisee trusted in himself that he was righteous. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. What brought him to that point? What's that? What brought him to that point to believe that? The Holy Spirit, yes. You're talking about the uh, publican? No, I'm talking about the Pharisee. Oh, the Pharisee. Oh, okay. Yeah, the Pharisee. That is, that is a good question. What, what did some, I heard somebody say something else. What was it? The law brought him to that point. We'll come back to that. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. It says, as, as it is written, there is how many righteous? So righteousness does not come from within ourselves. Meaning that... It's not, it's, righteousness is something that starts on the inside. That's, that's right. It starts on the inside, but it's not something that originates with you. Amen. It's not something that you simply tap into. I mean, that's, that's essentially spiritualism. You understand spiritualism? The new age agenda that we, you know, so-called today. New age philosophy is that you are perfect, you are a God, and you simply need to come to this realization and tap into the power within you. But Christianity in the Bible says there is nothing righteous in you. All your righteousness, all my righteousness is this filthy rags. We need a power outside of ourselves to come in and clean the mess that is our heart. That needs to clean the mess that I've made. So we can't simply, we can't simply discipline ourselves and change our outward behavior and think that we're righteous. I mean, that's what the Pharisee did. He said, I do all these things. I, I pay tithes, you know, I go to church. I, I'm doing all the right things. I, I, I don't commit adultery. I don't extort like the tax collector. And yet he was unrighteous. He was not justified. He didn't leave being justified. So it's not something we can simply choose to do. Now, choice is involved. Isn't that right? Amen. Choice is involved. God's not going to force us to be righteous He's not going to just come and change your heart unless you allow him to, and you've opened your heart unto him. So by nature, we're all in righteousness. Now, I want you to notice, because the Pharisee trusted in himself, trusted in his, his outward performance, and that he was dedicated to the service of God. Notice Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 28. 
Jesus speaks, you know, this is his sermon where he's rebuking the Pharisees and the scribes. Verse 20, 28, he says, Even so you, speaking to the scribes and the, and the Pharisees, even so you also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you're full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Wow. Could that be happening to some of us today? Hmm. To outwardly appear righteous? Is that, is, that a, is that something for, you think, that maybe Adventists struggle with? Let's be honest here. Because we believe in the commandments of God. We believe living a certain way according to the Scriptures. And that's good and well. But sometimes, maybe, maybe it's not in our heart. But we still go through the motions. God desires that inwardly, more than just the outward, because He says to the uh, Pharisees and the publicans, Outwardly you appear this way, but inwardly you're actually this way. So what, does, what value does Christ place on doing all the right things externally if internally we are wicked and corrupt? God desires more than just an outward conformity to a certain set of laws or rules. He desires that perfection would be on the inside. Amen. And that He would make your heart right. It's not enough to be perfect by doing all the right things outwardly when inwardly we're full of anger, bitterness, hypocrisy, lust, envy, selfishness. The list goes on and on. And... God wants to change who we are on the inside. Isn't that right? Yes. He wants to change the core of who we are. Just like my, uh, <laughs> you know, in my time and my uh, experience, I've learned that, that sin is like a wart. <laughs> Amen. That's why I told that story. You know? Is sometimes you can try to cut it off at the surface, but sometimes it goes deep, doesn't it? Yeah. It goes deep. And you thought you got it, <laughs> but then you find as time passes, it just pops back up. Amen. You ever experienced that? Yeah. I have. Yeah. I have. God wants to change who we are on the inside. Amen. It goes merely beyond an outward compliance. Turn to me to Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to be closing up here in just a couple minutes. Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews 7, verse 19, it says, For the law made nothing, what? The law made nothing perfect. <laughs> so the law can make nothing perfect. So perfection is not attained by keeping the law. Perfection is not a, attained or acquired by keeping the law. The law cannot make you perfect. Now, this is where we need to be Bible students. Yes. Because it says, the law cannot make you perfect, but yet Psalm 19 verse 7 says what? The law of the Lord is perfect. So the law is perfect. 
And it serves a role and a function. But that function is not to make you perfect. You understand that? So just to understand and know, like, you know, just because I say, hey, the law can't make you perfect, doesn't mean that I don't believe the law is perfect. Because the Bible clearly says that. The law is perfect. It says converting the soul. James 1.25, he also says that he calls it the perfect law of liberty. So the law is perfect, but yet it can't make you perfect. It only points out your imperfection. Amen. It only points out your imperfection. Now, the perfect man will walk in the law, but walking in the law is not what made him perfect. Now, let's make it real simple. Let's make it real simple. Turn to me to John 17. Because sometimes when you're looking at, you know, hey, righteousness by faith and, and the gospel and the law and the gospel. And I mean, it can be so complicated, right? You know, imputed righteousness, imparted righteousness, you know, justification by faith and versus righteousness by faith. It's like, you know, we throw out all these terms and, you know, we've been really good at theorizing the gospel. Yes. I find it kind of interesting and, and, and funny that, you know, I, I've seen ministries, I've seen groups, I've seen churches split over their differences in the gospel. And that happens all the time, right? Yeah. But what is actually happening, what happens more often than not, is that the split occurs because they disagree on the theory of the gospel. And so we've actually, in a large part, taken the gospel and created a whole theory out of it, and then we argue with each other whose theory is right. Mm -hmm. When in reality, the true gospel doesn't even get fulfilled. Because it's more than just that. Now, turn with me to John 17, verse 23. It says, I in them. Now, he's speaking to his father. Obviously, this is the prayer of Jesus right before he was taken and crucified. He says, I in them. Now, who's the them? Us. That's us, right? He's talking about his disciples, but he's also talking about us. He says, I in them. And then it, thou in me, that they may be what? Perfect in, in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. You know, John 17 really is very, very deep. Amen. I in them. And now in me, that they may be made perfect in one. Now, Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. Now, when I read that, it says, the Father is in Christ, and Christ is to be in us. And this is what will make us perfect. Now, he adds something there. He says, perfect in one. Now, that oneness is unity, right? That oneness is a, is a unity. A what? Family of God. The family of God, right. Now that doesn't destroy like our individual personalities, right? We're all individuals. But yet if we have the same spirit, the same mindset, the same mentality, which is the character and love of God, that will bring us into unity and love. And love covers a multitude of sins. Love, it's long-suffering. It bears long with each other, right? It's kind. So, what's that? It doesn't puff itself up. But really, the only way to perfection is laid out here in Jesus' uh, Jesus's words. He says, I in them. So if we want to get real simple, if you want to be perfect or be made perfect, there's only one way. And it's not through the law. Even though the law is perfect, it's not through the law or keeping the law. It's by having the Spirit of Christ in us. Amen. 
says, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect. That's plain and simple. Now we're to walk in the Spirit. And the Spirit is the one that fulfills the works of the law in us and through us. Isn't that right? Now, keeping the law is the result, not the means. The Spirit is the means. Having the Spirit of Christ in us is the means to keeping God's law and walking in all of His commandments. Now, turn with me to Galatians. Galatians, just a couple more verses here. Galatians chapter 3, 1 through 3. We read this this morning for Sabbath school. It says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Whose eye, who, who, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? That's really a good question. He says, having begun in the Spirit, is the flesh going to perfect you? No. Obviously not. He's like, you started through the Spirit, by the hearing of faith. And that's where you began. Do you think, you know, the flesh is going to perfect you? Now, I illustrate it sometimes in this way. What's that? Absolutely. So I illustrated the, this sometimes, and perhaps maybe you've experienced this as well. That, you know, when you first... How many, I believe everyone in here has had like a... You wouldn't be here if you had some sort of genuine experience Amen. with Christ Amen. and the Word, right? I think... You, Everyone's here because you've had, maybe to a lesser or greater degree, all, all of our experiences are different. But I would say that probably every one of you has had a real, true, genuine experience. Now, as you're thinking back in your life, would you say that's the case? Yes or no? Yes. Now, do you have that same, now has that experience lasted all throughout these years of being a Christian? No, no it hasn't, right? And that's part of the process, you know, it's a slow, it's a relationship. Any relationship is, is kind of the same. And a relationship, as a relationship develops, it becomes deeper and more meaningful and richer as it develops. You know, when you first meet your spouse or your girlfriend or boyfriend, it's like, it's all exciting and it's just, you got to have all these emotions and feelings and, and it's like, but over time, you know, that relationship with the person, it, it it becomes more meaningful and it becomes deeper, especially as you go through difficult times together. And as you've worked out some of the issues and problems and, and have gone through difficult times, that relationship uh, gets better and it becomes more meaningful. Well, have you ever... And I, I, I think this kind of illustrates the Adventist, maybe perhaps the Adventist experience uh, right here sometimes. That when we learn certain truths in the Bible, we, we get excited about it. Isn't that right? Perhaps maybe when you've learned some of the truths that we know and understand and love. You get excited and you have a zeal and a passion. But over time, that kind of wears off. And you're not quite as passionate as you used to be. Now, I'm not saying that should be the way, but it just happens. But perhaps maybe you've, you've in your experience, I remember when I first started studying the Advent message, and it was like I was watching this uh, series by Doug Batchelor, and he went through uh, everything about health. I'm like, okay, well... Guess I need to be a vegetarian, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I just took it at face value, you know. I was like, well, guess I need to be a vegetarian. Guess I need to do this and do that and do this. And like, it wasn't really like a big issue for me. It was like, wow, this is what I, I believe the Lord is asking me to do this. Yeah, of course, no problem. And I think a lot of us experience that sometimes. 
But when you lose that zeal, sometimes you lose that zeal and that first love and that passion and the reason why you're doing the things you do, but yet you keep going through the motions because you know intellectually it's the right thing to do, but your heart's not in it. Have you ever been in that experience before? Where it's like your heart is not in it, but intellectually you know that the Lord has revealed it to you in the past. And intellectually you know it's the right thing, so you force yourself to do it. That becomes Pharisee. <laughs> yes, and it becomes, that's when religion becomes a burden and drudgery. And the solution is not to walk away from God. The solution is that we need, you need a new heart. So whether you're doing all the right things or all the wrong things, the solution is the same. That God has to root out the sin problem at the core of our hearts and the core of who we are. And each one of us are dealing with that yes. in, in many different ways. Each one of us are dealing with that. Now, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, and Jesus said that your righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. So the Pharisees had an outward. It was outward. But he says, you need to exceed that. That's in Matthew 5, 20. Now in Matthew 5, as we close here, Jesus goes through a list as he's preaching his Sermon on the Mount. He goes through some very interesting things. He goes through Matthew 5, 21 and 22. He talks about anger. Matthew 5, 27 and 28, he talks about lust. You know, he says, you've heard... Thou shalt not commit murder. He says, but you're, if you're angry. And so he says, you've heard about the outward action, the actual act. But I'm going to bring it to the inside of your heart and say, if you're angry. So Jesus was bringing it back to the condition of the, of the inside. You know, man looks on the outward appearance. You know, man looks on the outside. And that's, I think, why, you know, sometimes when we get, become religious, we focus so much on the externals. And not that that's a bad thing. I mean, we should be walking in the light as far as possible, right? We need to be walking in the light. I mean, it's not a knock, but, but man looks on the outward. Think about this, this world. What does he look? He looks at people outward. Out, you know, we all, the world around us, they look at the outward appearance. You know, are they attractive? You know, are they beautiful? Do they have a nice body, a nice physique? You know, they look at the, the outward, the talents and abilities that people have and what they can do with their hands. This world looks at the outward. It looks at what man possesses Amen. and his house and his cars and everything that he has on the outward. You know, the big home and the, you know, the fancy cars and the, and the boats and, and, and all these toys that we gather together. That's what man looks out. And man, standing on the outside, he looks at the outside and he says, man, that guy is doing pretty good. But he doesn't see inside that home. He doesn't see inside the heart of that person. But God does. God does. And so my point this morning is God looks past all of the outward. And he looks to the inside. And I think we should uh, do the same. Now, going back to Matthew chapter 5, I just want to finish with a couple of verses here because this really hit me hard a couple of weeks ago when I was reading this. Because God's desire is that we would all be his children, be a part of his family, right? That we would be one in the family of God and that we consider ourselves to be brothers and sisters. Now, look at this, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. It says, You've heard that it has been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. Well, I'm wondering who's teaching that. <laughs> Probably the Pharisees, yep. scribes. They're teaching the people, Hey, it's okay, just love your neighbor, love those that are like you, but everybody else, it's okay, hate them. Right? Jesus says, You've heard. This way. But I'm telling you to do what? Love. love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. Pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. 
Hmm. Wow. I mean, we know this. We know this. But so many times we don't do it. Isn't that right? Somebody treats us wrong. Somebody does us wrong. We want revenge, right? I want to encourage you and encourage myself this week that we will really seek. Lord, I hope none of us have enemies. Okay? I don't think any of us have enemies in here. I don't think any of us are enemies. We're brothers and sisters, right? But I'm sure there's people that, you know, in your life, that you don't like. You don't get along with them. You just don't click with them. And they may not be your enemy. But you need to love them too. So I want you to pray this week, and I will as well. Lord, is there somebody that has done me wrong, said something about me, wasn't very kind to me. Is there somebody like that that I can show them your love? Now, why is this important? It's important because of verse 45. Now, I've never put these two together really. I mean, you know, you read something, but then it doesn't really hit. You know, it doesn't get, have that punch. But then you read it again, and it just like punches you right in the gut. And it's like, whoa, I never saw that before. He says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you that you may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. So if we're not loving our enemies, if we're not doing good to those that hate us, if we're not praying for those that despitefully use us and persecute us, are we the children of God? That's some heavy stuff right there. That's pretty heavy. But this is our high calling, right? Amen. This is why we need Christ, because we can only do that if Christ is within. Now, this is the reason. This is the reason. He says, For he, that's God the Father, he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good. See, this is the character of God. Amen. He makes the Son rise on those that are evil and those that are good. It says that he sends the rain on those that are just and those that are unjust. So whether a person is just or unjust, he's sending rain. He's giving them sunshine. He is giving them life. He's the same. Mm. It says, if you love them which love you, what reward have you? That's what the publicans do. If you salute your brethren only... What do you more than others? Do not even the publicans so? You see, God, He gives life, sunshine, right? He's constantly looking over and trying to care for and reach every single person in this world. Even if they curse Him to His face, He's still trying to reach that person. Yes, brother. Matt, this also tells me that in order for me to be perfect, to be like God, there is a necessity of someone in my life that I don't get along with or that I may have issues with mm -hmm. in order for me to put these things into practice. And for me, I have to identify who they may be so right. that I could show them that love. Right. And then he finishes off right here. Thank you. Uh, verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect. Even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. And so I started off with that text because when we read that uh, uh, isolated from the context, and we read it where it says, be perfect even as your Father is perfect. Well, what does that mean? Like we could get a different view and I think as Adventists we may think that that means okay well I have to act dress speak think 
you know, all of these right things. And sure, it may include that. But when we look into the context right here, when we look at Jesus's words, when he says, be ye therefore perfect, even as your father, which is in heaven, is perfect. What is he talking about? What kind of perfection is that no matter who it is, no matter what they've done, no matter what they've done to you or to others, he says, love them, bless them, do good, pray for them. That's what, he, that's what the father is like. And he says, be, what's that? Paul's thought to convert Nero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, has anybody, uh, has anybody ever bought a lemon? This is my last, uh, we're going to close here. Has anybody ever bought a lemon? Yeah. What's that? I'm talking about not the fruit, but the car. The car. The car. You never heard that before. Yeah, it's like, okay, so a, a lemon. A lemon is, is like a bad apple. <laughs> a lemon is like, well, it looks nice, right, on the outside, but the thing is just worthless. It's just full of bitterness, right, because it's always breaking down. You're always having trouble with it. And, and when you bought the car, if you, when you bought the lemon, and maybe we can talk about it later, you probably didn't think it was a lemon when you were buying it. Or you didn't expect it to be a lemon. You know, I can imagine that it looked good on the outside. It had a nice, you know, nice body to it. You know, there was no dents. Probably had a nice paint job. Interior was nice. But internally, it was a mess and it kept breaking down. What good is that car? What good is that car if it looks perfect on the outside? But yet the engine is knocking. Transmission is busted. What good is that car? It's pretty much worthless, right? What's that? Park it somewhere and burn it? Just admire it, right? Yeah. Park it somewhere and admire it. Now, has anybody done a restoration on a car? Has anybody ever restored a vehicle in here? Like, you know, a classic car? No? Well... Sometimes when you do a restoration or you're restoring a car, an older car, what do you have to do? Well, how do they do it? They strip that thing all the way down to the frame. They take it all apart. And methodically, they restore each and every part of that car until it's put back together. And it is the same. So, I mean, what point, if the frame is all rusted out, you're not just going to slap a paint job on it and call that thing restored. Am I right? If you're doing it properly. If the frame is rusted, the engine is broken, you're going to tear that thing down to its basic materials and you're going to restore every single bit of that. And I just use those illustrations. The lemon, the car, the wart. Because this is what God is wanting to do with us. And we can't be satisfied with a restoration that is not complete. God wants to completely restore each one of us. Amen. And that's going to be different for, for each one of you, what that looks like. We can't just put on a veneer and say that we've been restored. He wants to come deep down inside of the core of who we are and change us, not from the outside, but from the inside out. Amen. From the inside out. That's the way he does it. So let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, Father, we thank you so much for all of your blessings and for the Sabbath day. And Father... Lord, I'm just asking and praying for you to work on me, on the inside of my, my heart. And as the psalm says, search me, O God, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me into the way everlasting. And so, Father, we are asking you to reveal 
just the, the defects that we may cry out as the publican, cry out for Christ to come in and to cleanse us from every defect of character. Let us not condemn or point fingers at each other, Father, but let us help each other. Let us love one another. Let us fulfill the very character. Your character may be seen in us. That no matter what may happen to us, no matter what someone may do, our character and attitude will be consistent in the same. Just pray all these things. Bless the rest of our day and bless our fellowship. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>